Now we're going to take some of that basic general chemistry that you've learned and apply that to understanding some of the bigger molecules in your body. When we say macromolecules, we're talking in particular about four different categories of molecule. So in this next unit, we're going to build up to understanding the differences and characteristics of the four macromolecules. And those are the carbohydrates, the lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. These are the major categories of molecules in your body. They sound like a nutrition label. There's a reason for that. When you eat real food, you're eating either a plant or an animal. So you're eating the tissues of that plant or animal, and those tissues contain these macromolecules just as your tissues do. So it's very important to understand these different categories of macromolecule and the role they have in your body. In order to do that, you need to know some things about organic chemistry. Organic chemistry really means carbon chemistry. So organic chemistry equals carbon chemistry. Because all four of these macromolecules have carbon as their base. Remember that carbon needs to share electrons in order to complete its outer shell. And do you remember how many electrons carbon needs to share to complete its outer shell? Well, you can look at your periodic table and recall that carbon is in column four, which means it has four electrons in its outer shell, so it needs four more to make eight. You could also look and see that it's atomic number six and sketch the electron configuration. So one, two, in the first electron shell, three, four, five, six. So remember, that means that carbon has four spots in its outer shell it still needs to fill to have a full outer shell. So carbon will form covalent bonds. It will share electrons with other atoms in order to complete that outer shell. And it just so happens that carbon likes to share with other carbons. And when it does, it often forms a chain. So it's typical for us in organic molecules to have chains of carbon. And there are different ways that that chain of carbon can, can differ. And so I'm going to go through a quick list for you of just some basic ways that a carbon chain can differ. It's sometimes called a carbon skeleton and sometimes called a carbon chain because what's going to happen in those macromolecules is different things are going to attach to this carbon chain and that's what's going to give those four macromolecules their individual characteristics. Obviously, just carbon on its own is, is carbon. We can increase the length and we can rearrange these carbons to branch off from each other, but they're still just carbon. So what's going to give these different categories of molecule their function are going to be some things that attach called functional groups and we'll go through those as well. But first I just want to talk about some basic ways that a carbon chain or carbon skeleton can differ. Okay, so ways a carbon chain can differ. And the first most obvious one is just they can differ in length. If you recall, the, the first real organic molecule we looked at was methane, CH4. Remember one carbon sharing electrons with four hydrogens to complete its outer shell. So that, that organic molecule would just be one carbon long. But we can have organic molecules that are hundreds of carbons long. I'll do one that's just four. By the way, I, I've mentioned this term before and I'm going to mention it again because it's very important in this next unit. If you have a molecule that's just carbon and hydrogen or a region of a molecule that's just carbon and hydrogen, we call that a hydrocarbon. And remember, these don't mix with water. If you don't mix with water, you can either be called nonpolar or you can also be called hydrophobic. Important terms to remember. 
Okay, so obviously this one is one carbon long, this one is four carbons long. So that's the first basic way that a carbon chain can differ. And this shows that, differing in length. The other thing that can happen is rather than just having these all be linear, they can branch off from each other. So the second way a carbon chain can differ is in branching. Okay, so I can have this same molecule. And let's write the, the formula for this. Let's count the carbons and hydrogens really fast. One, two, three, four. Okay, so that would be C4 and then H, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. H10. So I can write C4H10 this way, or there are a number of other ways I can write C4H10. This would be C4H10 also. And in this case, rather than the carbons all being in a line, they are branched. Okay, so this one would be considered branched. This one would be considered linear. So linear versus branched, another way that carbon chains can differ. Another way that carbon chains can differ is they don't always just appear this way. Sometimes they can form rings. And the sugars in particular tend to do this. You're going to see that the sugars are going to going to form rings, so this would be glucose, where each of these corners of the ring represents a carbon, and then whatever is attached to the carbons would be radiating out from that. So sometimes carbon chains can form rings. Okay, and then finally, the last way that we're going to look at that carbon chains can differ is that sometimes we don't just have single bonds between carbons. So this would all be single bonds between carbons. We can sometimes have double bonds between carbons. And the location of those double bonds can change. So let's look at what would happen if we had double bonds between carbons. So remember, carbon needs to share four pairs of electrons. And this is the short way of showing that. So this carbon is sharing one, two, three, four. This one is sharing one, two, three, four, and so on. If I take that same carbon chain, and I put a double bond between these carbons. I still have four carbons, but look what's going to happen to my hydrogens. So remember, carbon has to share four, four pairs of electrons. So this guy is now sharing one, two, three, four. Okay, let's look at this guy. He's sharing one, two, three. He's sharing two pairs of electrons here. Remember, this double bond means sharing two pairs of electrons. So sharing two pairs of electrons is a double bond. And because of that, only one more hydrogen can attach. Same for this carbon. He's already sharing one, two, three. He doesn't have five to share, so two hydrogens can't attach. Only one. This last guy, only sharing one, so he can have three hydrogens. So re recall our formula for this way was C4H10. This is still C4. But how many H's do we have now? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that's because of this double bond, because carbon is sharing two pairs of electrons here. And of course, that double bond could be there or it could be there. So double bonds and the location of those double bonds. OK, so here's double bond position. And then finally, it rings. So those are the ways that a carbon chain can differ. But again, it's still just carbon. It's going to be what attaches to the carbons that give these chains their differences.
But before we look at those functional groups that give the carbons their differences, there's one more topic we need to look at in more detail, and that is isomers. So isomers are molecules that have the exact same chemical formula, but a different arrangement of those same atoms. We've kind of already looked at a couple of examples of, of that when we did the branching for C4H10. Those would be isomers. Same chemical formula, but different structure. So isomers are molecules with the same chemical formula, but different structure, different arrangement of those same atoms. And there are going to be three important categories of isomer that you should know. And those are listed on the board, or on the screen, I'm sorry. Structural isomers are going to be the first isomers we look at, then geometric isomers, and then enantiomers, also called stereoisomers. So let's start by looking at structural isomers. We've, we've actually already looked at two structural isomers. So structural isomers just really differ in the basic arrangement of the same atoms. There's no real pattern there for structural isomers. So the C4H10 example that we just looked at, where one is branched and one isn't, those would be structural isomers. Glucose and fructose, and galactose for that matter, those are structural isomers. Okay, they, they all have the exact same chemical formula, C6H12O6, but they do differ in their arrangement. So you can see that with glucose, we have carbon double bonded to an oxygen at the end of the molecule. Okay, and in fructose, it's not at the end. It's on the second carbon. They're both C6H12O6, but they just differ in the basic arrangement of those same atoms. No real pattern to it. The second category, geometric isomers, do follow a, a very specific pattern. Geometric isomers only occur when there's a double bond between carbons. And there are two categories of geometric isomer. Okay, so geometric isomers only occur when there's a double bond between carbons. And then whatever attaches to those carbons can either be on the same side or on opposite sides. Okay, so I'm just going to draw a very basic example here. I'm going to use a letter X to represent whatever's attached. So whatever's attached can either be on the same side of the double bond or on opposite sides. The word cis means same. And these are called cis isomers. This is the cis isomer. If this one had the exact same chemical formula and the only way it differed is what's attached is a cross, that would be called trans. Trans means a cross. This would be the trans isomer. Where have you heard the term trans? Thinking of those four macromolecules we already listed on the board. What about trans fats? We're going to talk about trans fats when we get to the lipid unit. The trans isomer is not the normal, healthy, natural isomer of those fats. It's man-made, and we'll talk about that. So geometric isomers differ in a very specific way. Again. Exact same chemical formula, the way they differ is whatever's attached to the carbons is either on the same side of the double bond or across from each other on the double bond. So this would be another example of that. So this would be the trans isomer. Those chlorines are across from each other. This would be the cis isomer. They're on the same side. Otherwise, 
exact same chemical formula. Okay, and then finally, the third one has a big name. When I was in school, they were called stereoisomers. Now they're more commonly called enantiomers. Enantiomers are mirror images of each other. So again, exact same chemical formula, but how they differ is that they are exact mirror images of each other. And there is a left-handed isomer and a right-handed isomer. You can see in this example, these are exact mirror images of each other. This has actual implications, real world implications in the pharmaceutical industry. So pharmaceutical industry, what happens is some chemicals that we use to make medications, we use to make drugs, will convert from one enantiomer to the other one. So pretend this is a drug, and you make the drug with this configuration, and over time, it starts to convert to this one. What if this one is physiologically active, but this one is physiologically inactive? Because remember, in the body, shape is key. Shape is key. The body doesn't recognize the chemical formula. The body doesn't count how many carbons, hydrogens, oxygens are in a molecule. It recognizes the shape. And if the shape is wrong, the body isn't going to process that molecule the same. It doesn't recognize it as being the same. So ibuprofen is a good example of a, a drug where over time some of it converts to the other enantiomer and it's inactive. That's how your medication expires. Not always. Sometimes it's actually bad for you. But in the case of ibuprofen, it just becomes less active over time. If you took it, it wouldn't make you sick. It just wouldn't have the desired effect because a lot of it has converted to this isomer. Another thing that can happen is it can convert to an isomer that's actually dangerous. Thalidomide was a, a morning sickness drug that was given to moms in the 50s and 60s during the first trimester of their pregnancy. And thalidomide had one isomer that was very beneficial in reducing the nausea associated with morning sickness. But the other isomer actually caused major birth defects in babies. During that first trimester when their little limbs are developing, that drug was interfering with normal limb development in those babies. So one isomer that had a good effect, the other isomer, rather than having no effect, actually had a really bad effect. And then finally, you can have a situation where you can have two isomers, both with two different desired effects, and in that case you can isolate those two and market them as two different drugs. So huge implications in the pharmaceutical industry in antimers, mirror images of each other. Okay, so these are the three categories of isomer. So structural, again, just differs in basic arrangement. Geometric, you're going to have a cis and a trans. Cis means same side, trans, opposite side. It's always going to involve carbons with double bonds. And then finally, in antimers, left and right handed mirror images of each other. Okay, in the next video, we're going to talk about the functional groups that attach to those carbon chains to give those macromolecules their very different characteristics.